All right, so <laughs> welcome back to Doc's House Calls. This week is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, once again, we've got a uh, world famous blogger, Joshua yep. from the UK on with us instead of a <laughs> micro brand owner. And um, Josh, I wanted to get you on, actually, I, I wanted to get you on for a while because yeah. um, I like having bloggers on every so often to get sort of a different perspective on the business, yeah. you know, micro cool. and all of that. Um, but also, uh, in particular, in your situation, you're hosting or you're organizing, uh, I'll let you tell me which, a, uh, an upcoming yep. watch event, which by the time this airs will be this coming weekend. So uh, this yep. coming Saturday. So why don't, we, why don't we start off with that and then we'll backtrack oh. into your life as a blogger. Tell us about this yeah. event on Saturday. Okay. Cool. So uh, yeah, this coming Saturday, it's um, basically what you guys have done alongside uh, Lauren from the Time Bum. Um, I wanted to sort of like do a similar thing in England because we have a few events, not too many, but they're mainly in either London or up north around Manchester or even further north in Scotland. However, I'm in the Midlands and there's not really any events around there. So first of all, I wanted to sort of do an event in my locality uh, because there's loads of watch fans around here. You know, there's big cities around here and no one's got anything nearby to, to do anything or enjoy anything with fellow watch enthusiasts. But also there's loads of pretty awesome English or British brands that don't really have any opportunity to show off their watches uh, because there's quite a few online only brands as you'd expect but um, they don't really get the chance to to have a table get the watches out there's a couple of events out there uh, which do it really well in in Britain however I thought there was a, there was enough room for another one uh, especially for like more micro brands um, so yeah I just I was chatting to Lauren about it and what you guys do in, in DC. Um, and he was like, yeah, man, just do it. It's, it's really good. And right, uh, so thank you. <laughs> my, my other, my external screen is over here. It's why I keep looking this way. So I'm looking at you on the map. You're in Warwickshire, which looks like yep. it's about two hours north uh, west, I guess, of London. But it looks like it's pretty close to Birmingham. So is Birmingham yeah. kind of like the closest big city? Yeah, Birmingham is probably the third biggest city behind sort of like Manchester and London. Um, there's a couple of other cities like Leicester, Coventry as well, which is slightly smaller, but we're all like condensed around in the middle. Okay. Um, so London is, is to the outskirts from rugby. It's only really about an hour's drive. Um, and it's about an hour on train as well. So um, obviously, if any fans from down there do want to come up, then it's not a massive journey, really. Well, let, let's cover the, um, the basics. So the event is at the Holiday Inn Hotel Rugby in Warwickshire. This coming yep. Saturday, the 9th, at, yep. it starts at look, 1 p.m., 1300, yep. and goes to 1800. Is that 6 o'clock? Yep. I, I, it's been a while since yep. I was in the military. All right. <laughs> so, nice, One, nice, good event. Um, and you got some great brands. These are brands that yep. you don't always see at these other uh, events. Like, they probably didn't make yep. it to Watch Time London. So, uh, tell me about the brands. Are they all based in, in the UK? Or are they some from yep. the continent? Yeah, exactly. For this first one, because it's, it's the inaugural Watch It Watch Fair. I, I'm, I don't know what to expect, to be completely honest. So I don't know how many people will turn up. Um, you know, it, there's a little bit of nervousness around it uh, because I don't know how successful it will be. So I wanted to keep it reasonably small <laughs> and then uh, go from there for the next time. Because if it is successful, then I definitely want to keep on going. Um, so yeah, there's some really, really awesome brands. I did go to Watch Time, which was really good. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. So. Um, that sort of like gave me another little bit of a push to just make sure I just get on and do it because it was so good. And everyone I spoke to there really enjoyed it as well, both from the watch brand's perspective, but also people who were visitors. Um, so Christopher Warder, a pretty big one, um, pretty uh, pretty chuffed with, uh, with that um, signing, if you will. And then there's some uh, other pretty awesome UK brands. So, um, so these are uh, all based in the UK? Yeah, these are all British brands. Okay, this yeah. is kind of cool. So I know some of these guys. So obviously I've heard of Christopher Ward. I don't know Christopher yeah. Ward, but yeah. I see you've got Hampton. That's Ross Davis. I know Andy yep. Seeley from Malls. Um, exactly. I'm connected with Jared Stedman from William Walker on uh, Facebook. Yep. I love what these guys from, uh, is it the Vap, Vap House? Is that Vap how you say it? Yeah. Vap House? Vap House, I think. Yeah, yeah I love their they're first design and their, and their, their recent uh, Bicompax Chrono was just yeah. gorgeous. But I haven't heard of some other brands, so I've never heard of Carrington Smith. That's an interesting one. I was just looking at Yeah, they're relatively new. 
They're new this year, actually. And I've seen, is it Alkin? Alkin, yeah. So Alkin, he's, uh, I've seen him around. They've got kind of a great sort of a dramatic, almost like de facto style. Yes, yeah. And he's good mates with uh, Ross from Hampton. So he, they sort of like came as a package deal. <laughs> but I'm going to get them free. Okay. And Gage yeah. Instruments was interesting. I'm looking at their website. They've got some, some kind of yeah, some stuff cool, going on. Yeah, interesting uh, stuff there. Uh, another watch manufacturer I'm pretty excited to see is Pinion as well. They've got some really yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, Pinion really does some nice work. They make some gorgeous designs. You know, a little bit more conservative for my taste, yeah. but yeah, sure. you know, obviously very well regarded and, and very good quality from what I've heard. Um, yeah. Isotope, you got Jose, uh, Jose Miranda coming. Jose, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he's uh, he's in London, so he's he's coming up as well. That's great. Um, yeah, so we've also got um, Art of Horology. I don't know if you've seen them on social media at all. They do watch-based posters. I was just looking at them on the Watch It yeah. Watch Fair website. Yeah. Tell me about so, Zero West. I, I just started seeing this brand. Somebody is posting them on Facebook, and it looks like they've got a really big product range already. Are they? Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, are they just like, like just, we're going to make a lot of watches all of a sudden out of nowhere? <laughs> or is there a story I, there? I, I, I'll be completely honest. I don't know the history behind it just yet. All I know is that uh, they are fully British and we've had a nice chat and they're, they're well up and very excited to, uh, to obviously be at the watch fair to show off their product. So uh, I'll certainly be, uh, be speaking to them a little bit further and probably getting a watch in for review, hopefully. I know their, their prices are a little bit more on the ex uh, more expensive than the affordable kind of range of watches uh, that I tend to well, review, but still, they look nice. And pin, pinions aren't cheap. Isotope aren't oh. cheap, you know? Yeah. Christopher yeah. Ward is getting up there. They are actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this but, is uh, great. Uh, well, I hope everybody has a great time. I hope the brands yeah. feel like it's worth it. And uh, cool. you know, so give them all my best. Thank you. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. Um, right, so, yeah, so we'll see how it goes. It just, you know, it, it's free to attend, I assume, for people that yes. want to visit? It is, absolutely. There is a Facebook group that I've been trying to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I've been trying to get anyone who's interested to join the Facebook group, because then I can get a bit of a better idea on numbers, because at the moment, I'm, all the brands are putting it out there, I'm putting it out there, um, and there's no real way of gauging how many people are likely to come, so. No, you really won't. The, it, it's tough. I've done that with our, our um, so here in Philadelphia, the last like six years, I've organized our Philadelphia get together and we got yeah. guys coming in from DC and New York. New right. York's about two hours north, DC is about two hours south. Yeah. And there we could literally have an event where we have 20 or 30 guys or 50 or 60. And there's just, sure. I've tried yeah. to get guys to join our Facebook group and say, look, I don't, I'm not trying to get you to reserve a seat, but just yeah. tell me if you're going to know. I don't know. Yeah. Because I'm also trying to get brand owners to come and they ask like, how many guys are going to be there? And I'm like, yeah, I, can't well, guarantee. I don't know. Yeah. Guys say they're going to be there and they don't show, or guys just show up and like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, again, I'm in a very similar situation. Um, so, I think the Facebook group itself's got about 110 people in the group. Uh, however, that's obviously going to be full of loads of people who are interested but aren't actually going to come. Um, and then on top of that, there's going to be people who don't even use Facebook. So, well, I, and I saw, like, so I was looking at your um the watch it event page and i yeah. was looking at who said they were interested and i recognized the name of a guy who's local here in philadelphia i know this <laughs> guy yeah no he's a he's like a friend of a friend and yeah. i'm looking and i'm like i don't think he's gonna make it <laughs> he's not going England. Yeah. he's like oh yeah i'm interested no you're not <laughs> well yeah, well uh, at least we'll be able to keep on track of uh, of what you know how it goes then i guess <laughs> so all right, so is there anything else you want to tell us about the fair, or should we move on? No, I mean, if, uh, if anyone is in England who's watching this, then, uh, yeah, come. <laughs> come All along. Right. Add the, uh, join the Facebook group, click going on the event. That's, uh, that would be the ideal thing, really. All right, so just to wrap it up, this Saturday, yep. Holiday Inn Warwickshire, 1 p.m., be yep. there. Great chance we'll to see there. all these brands in person and meet the brand owners. Exactly. And if, uh, if it's successful, then hopefully next year it'll be even better. I had yeah. loads of other um, amazing uh, watch manufacturers. I mean, there's loads of British brands that are out there, but some of them just respectfully declined. Like, look, we don't know how it's going to be, which is absolutely fine. Some of them were already booked up for this weekend as well, which obviously is gusting, but never mind. Um, so that's an interesting segue. So 
you know, I read Longitude this past year, and it was, you know, I, I've always had this affinity for uh, people in the UK because th that's been like my second biggest market. Yeah. And um, I read Longitude. I was pleasantly surprised to read sort of the history of real, you know, modern horology going back to John Harrington. Yeah. Well, John Harrington, right? No, John, John Harrison. Harrison, yeah. 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 So back in the 1700s, and I was like, wow, like this is kind of amazing. Everybody talks about Swiss watches, and yet <laughs> the father of modern horology is in the UK. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, so I just kind of got interested in how now it suddenly makes sense to me how many times I, I notice it seems like there's this push to bring horology back to the UK in a big way. Yeah, and there's yeah. so many great UK based brands. Yeah. Here comes the butt. Yeah. I've heard this again and again, and I've seen this firsthand where somebody's trying to do an event and you can't get these brand owners out of the office. Like yeah. you, you, your brand isn't carried in that many stores. I can't go on every street corner and see your watches in person. Yeah. This is one or two times a year yeah. when you have an opportunity to put your product in front of exactly. your, your core customer. Yeah. Why wouldn't you go? So yeah. is it, you know, the, the, the British tendency to be a bit more, re, you know, reserved and yeah, retired, maybe. or is it something else in your mind? I don't know. Um, I think it is that slight reservation from a bit British point of view. Maybe it's just as well because there's not many of these kind of events knocking around yet, so they don't really see the... See, I see that as all the more reason to go. There, it's yeah. not like if, if these were happening every week, I would say, no, I just did yeah, that's true. I can't do another. But this <laughs> yeah. is like twice a year. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because watch time, uh, world time is very good. Is a very good one. Um, and they had about thirty brands, I think. Um, I don't know. They didn't actually publish how many visitors they got, but it was fairly busy when I was there. Um, I think I heard around four or five hundred. That's pretty neat. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, and and to your point earlier about you yeah. know this is your first event and obviously you wanted to grow. I mean, yeah. we've seen that with District Time, where yeah. it's gotten bigger every year. Yeah. Um, of course. And you know it's. It takes time, but it also takes promotion, pre yeah. preparation. And mm -hmm. I think, speaking as a brand owner, I would like it if I could see more brands just go, <laughs> yes, like I'm going to take a chance on the expense of traveling to be there and taking a day yeah. you know, out of my life to be there, even if there's a chance it won't be huge because yeah. somebody's got to be the first mover. And if I always kind of feel like if I go, maybe some other brands will see me go and go, oh, well, Chris is going. Yeah. It must be worthwhile. Yeah, exactly. show up. Yeah, I think I think one of the actual big pulls I had was um, Chris Ford were actually the first people to say yes, and they're a pretty big brand. That's a great get for you because Chris yeah. Ward is like an anchor brand. So that may, exactly. I, if I were in the UK and you said, oh, Chris Ward's going to be there, I'm like, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, exactly. So I uh, I went uh, sort of this time last year, actually, um, to Chris Ward HQ, and I did a video uh, interview with Chris himself, and I sort of like mentioned it then. I was like, hey, Chris. What do you think of this? You know, I'm sort of thinking of doing like a little uh, watch exhibition with brands. Hopefully you'd like to come. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Great idea. We'd love to come. So I was like, awesome. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's roll with it then and see where we get uh, with, uh, with other brands. And then I was sort of like shooting a few other emails. Ross from Hampton was actually the, uh, one of the uh, pioneers behind it all as well. He was really pushing it. He was like, look, it's a great idea. Um, and he actually said, you know, it's good. It's a good idea coming from sort of like a watch review site as well, because you have those ties, those affiliations with a load of different brands as well. So um, I, after a few emails, I got like six or seven brands just say yes straight away, uh, which was a pretty good start. And then I was like, right, yeah, let's definitely go go for it. So, yeah, it was it's pretty, pretty exciting and only a few days away now. So. Let's change gears and talk about your blog. I'm looking at okay. it right now. It All looks right. fantastic. Um, oh, cool! Thanks. I'm actually. I can tell you've made some made some format changes. Yes. Uh, since a few years ago. Yeah. Um, I'm makes, thinking of redesigning it again, actually, to be honest. So. Really? Yeah. I, mean, I love I love the layout. I mean, it's it's almost like it, it's almost too much. I kind of understand if that's where you're going with it, where yeah. there's just so much to look at. But I think it's great, and um, you know. I've always thought you produced great quality content. You know, your writing and your photography and your videos are all really good. And, you know, there's not that many guys in the UK that are doing it at your level. So, cool. so let's, let's kind of roll the clock back. How did you, yeah. how long have you been doing this? When did you get started? Why did you start? Sure. Yeah. So, um, what's it all about? 
uh, was launched in 2013. Um, so I was working as a, well, still am, a website developer. So I was obviously a watch nerd already, flipping watches left, right and centre. And I was like, you know what, all these watches are sort of like going through my hands. I might as well just make a blog and just start taking pictures of them and collating my thoughts on them. And so that's how it started, basically. I just got a WordPress theme, installed WordPress and started writing away. Obviously, to begin with, it was a bit rubbish and a bit, uh, uh, the quality just wasn't there. But as with everything, you learn as you go. Uh, it's now what like- What do you mean the quality wasn't there? The quality well, of the content like, well, or the website yeah. itself? No, just the content really. I mean, the, the website looked all right. It did its job, but the content, uh, the photography was okay. Not as good as it is now. Uh, the videos uh, were all right. Again, I've made a like a, an effort with that recently as well. Uh, and the writing quality was just, I didn't have the practice. So again, it was a little bit basic. So throughout the six years, I've constantly tried to, to improve steadily um and so it's like had a steady growth as well i've um i've been asked by a couple of other blogs to like write for them and i've been asked to to have like guest reviewers as well i tend to try and just keep it to myself just because i think from a reader's perspective yes uh whilst i may not publish as often uh it gives you that level playing field it's always my thoughts and my photography my videos etc etc right uh, so i, I I like to think sort of like, you know, just being me, just, just my published uh, posts. I think that's quite a nice little USP of mine. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point. I know other bloggers, you know, like Lauren, the time bomb will yeah. sometimes have a guest blogger and I've yeah. never, it's never occurred to me that if the other guy isn't as good or, or being as diligent, let's say yeah. as Lauren, you know, to your point, it's maybe not a level playing field and it's not giving that brand or that watch the same opportunity could be seen, uh, yeah it could be yeah. seen that way i just wanted to avoid that basically and also uh, maybe i've been a bit picky but i've never anyone who has offered i've never really uh i i'm quite proud of like the the quality of photos and videos and i'd want it to to be that quality as well <laughs> yeah no i so i don't want to name names but i've seen this firsthand where sure. um blogs a lot of times guys are like you one, one man show blogs they get a bit you know when you grow a little bit and people start saying i'd like you to review my watch yeah. all of a sudden you have a full dance card and yeah. your time becomes really compressed and stretched and yeah. it's tempting i think to bring on a guest blogger and i've seen guys do that and i've dealt with the guest bloggers and i thought yeah. this really? guy shouldn't be involved right. in a blog he's not a good writer he doesn't yeah. even seem like he knows about the product right and he, the questions they ask sometimes are, you know, they betray a, a lack of knowledge. And yeah. then I read your review and it's, it's not the details are wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's a shame, especially from a brand point of view. Like if you send your watch for, for a review and you like, you look through all the other reviews and you're like, yeah, I'm expecting, you know, nice quality content here. Uh, and then you get something that you're a bit disappointed in, then you, yeah. it's a bit of a shame really, isn't it? So. so I noticed that this is something I just saw on your website when under the reviews tab, yeah, you actually have reviews broken out several different ways by price, yeah. which is interesting. I think that's a good thing. I think people appreciate yeah. that. I certainly yeah, yeah. if I were coming to your blog to read it. Sure. Um, sure. And you know, you've got, I think, some, something that a lot of blogs tend not to do, but I think is good to do. You've yeah. got something called my favorites, which I think, yeah, okay. you know, the value of being a blogger for the audience is. I want your opinion. You're supposed to know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I, I kind of want you to tell me what you think about this yeah. stuff and why instead of like, I can read the specs for myself on somebody's website. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, that's great. Um, and sometimes like seeing it in pictures, a watch might look amazing in pictures, but actually when you handle it, it's like, mm, okay. Or the other way around, it might look fairly average in pictures, but actually the metal, it's like flipping it. This is mind blowing. So I suppose when uh, when someone's handled three to four hundred watches and they can say, you know, these are the ones which particularly stood out, then I suppose that's it's quite a handy thing for the readers. Yeah, I mean, I, that goes back to the value of these events for the brands. I was thinking about this today. I was thinking, you know, yeah. how many times have, have I seen somebody online saying this watch, the, the photos online don't do it justice. I, mean, I hear that about mine, but I've seen that 
personally too, but other brands, yeah. you know, there's a brand out of Japan called uh, Minase, which, yeah. you know, they're not cheap watches and, you know, Japanese brand, Swiss movements, I think they're amazing in person. And I just yeah. don't think no matter how good the photography is, you can really get a sense for how yeah. good and how amazing those watches are. Um, but like you said, I mean, a lot of times watches look really great in photography because somebody paid a lot of money to make them look great. <laughs> yeah. And you get well, the watch, you're like, yeah, this is crap. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, I've actually reviewed a handful of your watches as well, Chris. I had uh, three Lewin Hueys um, and uh, two NTHs. My favorite being the Amphium Dark Gilt. So is there any chance that's... You still have it? No, I had to send it back. <laughs> oh, I thought you got it for yourself. Yeah, no, 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 unfortunately not. Um, that's a funny question. That's a funny question, actually, because um, sort of like with, I think we we're going to discuss it a little bit later. But like, life as a watch reviewer, um, the buying watches for yourself can be a little bit difficult, um, and um, you don't tend to do it without having a sort of like an ulterior motive of you're buying a watch to review. So yeah. you don't tend to buy watches for yourself anymore. Uh, which is a shame. Started what you said five years ago, six years ago it was six yeah. Years ago. Yeah. Okay. So and obviously, you know, you're not fantastic when you start. You get yeah. fantastic hopefully over time. Definitely. Yeah. Do, have you noticed? Uh, have your have your taste changed since you started? You do you find like as a blogger, not just as a collector, but as a blogger, like. I've seen this watch in another form so many times. I kind of don't want to review this again, even though it's a it's a different brand, different model. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that, where it's like it's another three hundred meter, you know, sapphire crystal <laughs> Seiko diver, and it's just not it's just not interesting anymore? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I tend to, I trend, I I try to put out content which I know readers will enjoy and appreciate. So if it is a particularly popular watch, uh, I still think it's worth putting my thoughts together on it. Uh, if, it's, um, if it's a watch which doesn't interest me personally, then I, I won't bother, you know, I respectfully decline because I only really want to review watches that I sort of am interested in, have a have passion, you know, a passionate about as well, because then that will come across in the quality of work. I won't feel like it's a, a right slug spending time and dedication uh, because, you know, I don't charge for reviews. So it's not as if, uh, oh, it's all right. I'm getting X amount of quid for doing this. So I'll just do whatever, right. you know, it's my time at the end of the day. And, you know, each review does take quite a lot of time. So I only really review watches that will do excite me and do interest me. Um, from a taste point of view, I still am like mainly into my divers with like bracelets. Uh, I did really like like properly chunky watches, but that's sort of like disappeared a little bit I suppose that's probably the same with quite a lot of people as they get into the the swing of things in terms of being a proper watch enthusiast um, they do prefer the slightly slender more elegant timepieces rather than just big brash things whereas at the beginning I was like yeah the bigger the better awesome yeah look at this massive lump of steel on my wrist and now it's not quite not quite as um not quite as harsh as that if you will uh, my taste um I'm also getting to appreciate the the finer things as well, like the smaller watches, uh, like dress watches, properly proper dress watches, like 36, 38 mil as well. Whereas beforehand, I wasn't really interested in that kind of thing, but now I'm really starting to appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll definitely say as you as you handle so many watches, and just as time progresses, your naturally your taste will change. Um, I expect the same from from your kind of point of view as well, isn't it? Do, do you sh do you from your designs from like when you first started out? I mean, how many years you've been going for? Notice your taste changing through your designs as well. Yeah, I mean, both in terms of what we design. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten you know sort of more narrow in what we find interesting and what we like um, as a business owner it's a challenge to try to figure out when we need to make something that doesn't really appeal maybe necessarily to me personally but make it because we think it'll sell versus there may be something that i really like but it's not worth making because it doesn't have enough of an appeal you got to try to find the balance somewhere in the middle um but also and i i don't like saying this because i think it makes me sound 
snobby or arrogant, but I've also seen so many watches because I've been doing this. I'm now in my seventh year making watches. Okay. So I've been to so many get togethers and so yeah. many fairs and I've been to so many ADs. Like I'll make, there are times when I'll make a trip to an AD or to a local jeweler just to see something in person to get a feel yeah. for what it's like. You yeah. I'll look at an Oris or a Tudor or, or you know, what have yeah. you. And after a while, it takes a lot to impress me. And, and <laughs> there's like, I'm often more impressed by something under a thousand dollars and how yeah. good it is yeah. for the money mm -hmm. much more often than I am impressed with something that is five or eight thousand yeah. dollars because it's like it simply cannot live up to that price yeah, in yeah. terms of you're not I'm not going to be blown away by it for five yeah. or eight thousand yeah. dollars <laughs> but there are some there are things that like um I just got to see the uh Dorenzo DRZ02 okay. yeah uh, at the uh the the event here in DC a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's a very, I always loved the design, but in hand, it's like, okay, now I can feel how good the quality is. Right. That's an amazing watch for what it yeah. costs, you know? Yeah. So um, to your point, yeah, but also um, in design, I mean, I've kind of embraced divers, obviously, especially with sort of a vintage feel. Um, yeah. When you look back at what we started out doing with, you know, Lou and Huey, it was, well, you know, we started out with a chronograph, which I don't even find yeah. interesting anymore. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and then we kind of did, you know, the Spectre, bigger, you know, sort of barrel case pilot. Um, we gradually kind of started to get more refined, uh, yeah. focusing more on case design, in particular case thinness. And yeah. now I'm more interested in alternative materials and um, look, just little things that, it's very difficult to find ways to differentiate when you don't have a hundred years of heritage, you don't have billions of dollars in R and D, you're not able to make your own movements in house. It, you know, yeah. you're basically up against a lot of other brands that are making the same, using the same materials when they make their watches. So, yeah. you know, there's other guys using the same materials, same movements that I am. Yeah, you have to di differentiate on design and maybe customer support and marketing, but I'm always looking for like, what can we do technically that is actually different that nobody's really doing or, or you know, or hasn't done a lot of yet, or how do we take that and make it better? And it's mm -hmm. difficult, it's a challenge. Yeah. Hmm. Um, is the uh, uh, Amphion Dark Guilt, is that coming back at all? That's not on your website at the moment, is it? No, uh, well, it's... The answer to your second question, no, it's not on my website. Yeah. It's, well, here, you know, so here's an interesting dilemma. Sure. When you make a lot of watches yeah. and then they sell out, do you continue to show them on your website or do you take them down? Mm. And I've been asked, you know, like to maintain this ongoing archive of imagery and specs yeah. and prices so yeah. that people, I guess, you know, if they have yeah. one, they can go back and refer to yeah. it, but or it becomes unwieldy. Yeah. So, um, if we don't have something either in stock on my website or at one of our retailers, I'll typically take it down, especially if we're not planning on making it again anytime soon. Um, yeah. Okay. With the uh, Barracuda vintage black that we made this year with the yeah. guilt relief dial, I've had friends and customers say, I love it. I love the guilt dial. It's a fantastic piece. I really hate snowflake hands. So if you made that uh, as the Amphion with yeah. that guilt relief dial, which is different because the one you're talking about, the, 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 what do we call it? The dark guilt, Amphion dark yeah. guilt or yeah. Um, so that had, right. So that had a more traditional dial with applied markers. This would be yeah. something different. So I'm trying to think, yeah, okay. I want to make that, but it is like, call? Yeah. we ha we already had an Amphion vintage black with the sandpaper texture dial. We already had an Amphion okay. dark guilt. I've already got an Amphion modern. Okay. What do I call it? So, so we're thinking about that for next year. So do you tend to not bother? <laughs> Not, not necessarily not bother, but once you've done a run of three or 500 units, say, do you, do you say, right, that's it, the next time I won't do exactly the same twice in, twice in a row? Or do you, has there been any ranges where you have reordered it exactly the same? Yeah. They like um, the super, super sellers then that you keep. No, so th this, is, this is real deep in the weed stuff, and I'll, I'll try <laughs> to simplify it and make it short. But, um, <laughs> 
to, to kind of take it at, from the macro, the factories want us to make a minimum of 500 pieces. You can yeah. sometimes talk them down to 300, but for a small brand, especially one just launching or in pre-launch, selling 300 watches is not easy. Yeah. Especially if you try to set pricing where it needs to be to grow your business and be profitable. Yeah. So what ends up happening is some guys will underprice the product and it'll sell out or sell yeah. very quickly, but they don't have profitability. Yeah. So let's just take 300 as a starting number. Um, how many colorways do you make? Do you make two, three? Do you do date, no date? The challenge is if I make, let's just say one dial black with a yeah. date, without a date, I have to make 50 of each of those dials. So right. if you take a 300 piece production and you make three colorways with mm -hmm. or without a date, yeah. okay, there's your six versions. That's all you can make unless you want to make more dials and just put the ones you can't use on a shelf and hopefully come back to them later and right. make more of that same watch. But then you have to figure out, all right, well, what if we make these three colors, date, no date, and one of them sells a lot and one of them doesn't. Well, if the yeah. one that, if there's one that doesn't, I'm not going to want to make more of those. Why, mm -hmm. What's the point of having those dials on the shelf? So you come back and you go, well, the model did well, but that color didn't. So let's make more of this model, but let's change it up with some new colors. Right. So I've been through multiple productions of this model, this case, but we changed the dial in some way. Right. Um, and then there've also been those where we made, 50 or 100 pieces and they sold out pretty quickly and there yeah. was clearly enough demand to make more so we've yeah. made 300 of the barracuda vintage black just this year that was been that's been our best-selling model this year okay uh, the knack and modern blue has been popular for the last like three years so we've made yeah. a lot of those I, I i don't have the numbers off the top of my head but then there are other models where i'll make 50 and that's it they didn't sell quickly enough and i don't have people asking me to make more yeah. Know, not that often or not often enough, I won't make more. And it's not, it's not about making it limited. It's just, if I can't sell, what's the point of making them? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So it's a constant learning and evolving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I think this is something that a lot of micro brand owners that are in pre-launch or even early on in their business don't realize is that, yeah. you know, and it's, it's one of the challenges in the business. It's, it's an industry wide challenge. The yeah. vendors all think that they need to meet these minimum order quantities and that it's easy for us to, to, you know, like 300 to a vendor is a small number. 300 to, to a micro brand owner is a huge number. Yeah. When you fit, when you factor in, okay, the, there's tens of thousands of dollars being invested in production. And this is something we cover in micro brand university. Ask any accountant how quickly inventory should turn over in an inventory business. And they'll say 90 days, three months. So in other words, I shouldn't make anything if I can't sell all of them on average in 90 days. And I know from, from my own experience, I've had some, in, I've had inventory on some models for two years and so, I'm not unusual. I mean, I think yeah. this is not just small brands, it's big brands. Swatch yeah. group, Swatch group has two years of inventory on hand at any given time. And that's just assembled inventory. If you, if you look at parts ready for assembly, it's double that. So yep. it's industry wide. We all have a major problem with overproduction, overpricing, and trying to, to trying to right size the, the the supply versus demand is very difficult. Hmm. Oh. Thank you for for answering that. So I told you it was deep in the weeds when I started. <laughs> open the can of words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you really did open a can there. I, I, no, well, that, was, and that was a quick version, by the way. Yeah. I spent an hour doing that. Well, I suppose uh, I see I see your comments quite often on uh, sort of like the um, micro brands uh, Facebook group, which are of a, are of a very similar ilk. Uh, yeah. Many many guys go in nice and cheap, sell out, and then they're like, "Great, but we didn't make any money." <laughs> so the yeah. next next model is more expensive, and everyone's lost interest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if people think, "Oh, well, you know." He just had this enormous Kickstarter project. He's got to be making some money. He makes it up on volume. And the challenge is that most of our costs in this business are variable costs, meaning, you know, it's like production costs are our biggest cost. So if you're not making enough money, gross margin profit on your sale over your production cost, you'll never make that up on volume. And then when you add in your fixed cost, your, you know, your overhead, just running your business, you, you could end up losing money. And it, you could put up a huge number on Kickstarter and yeah. still lose money. 
Yeah, yeah. You think you're making a profit until you sit down with your accountant at the end of the year and he goes, you know, you're 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 not pricing high enough. Yeah. But at the same time, if you price too high, then you have no turnover. So, you know, what's what good is it to have your price way up here if you don't sell anything? So it's yeah. about finding that right balance point. Yeah. I think that's what I've been impressed um with your brands uh most actually, because you have really like stuck to your pricing structure. You do you ever have sales or if you do, it's very rare or if it, no, it's not necessarily sales. Sometimes you'll have like five, 10% sort of like offers or is it $25 off, $50 off, but not, it doesn't. Not recently. I mean, we, you know, I, I went through an evolution. So like, I think most micro brand owners, when I started out, it was let's do a huge discount in pre-order or on Kickstarter. And, and I'm talking, this is 2013, 2014. I think the real boom on Kickstarter and crowdfunding projects started about 2014, 2015. So I was about a year ahead of that. So yeah. when I was, just to start off with some basic numbers, when I did the Ricardo, the retail price on that was $550. Our starting pre-order price was 450. So only a hundred dollars less. Yeah. And that's a little bit less than 20% discount from retail. Mm -hmm. Right now, the typical pre-order early, you know, the super early bird, it's like 50% yeah, off. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so the world has changed. They're, you know, everybody's in this, you know, really heated competition. And most people don't have a huge marketing budget and they're doing it part time. So they don't have a lot of time to promote. And the, the way we see them trying to offset that, that weakness is by underpricing. And so, you know, it's a race to the bottom. So I went through this period of time where everything was pre-orders and Kickstarter at a discount because I was asking customers to wait four to six months for delivery, sometimes longer. And, you know, there was a reason. And I still think there's a reason. If you're, if you're asking someone to wait six months to get the watch, yeah, there better be a discount involved. Yeah. But the problem is after that, once you get the watches in stock, now you're supposed to be charging full price. And if somebody <laughs> bought the watch at full price and then you discount the next week, yeah. they're angry at you. It hurts your yeah. brand image. Yeah. It's very difficult to recover from that. And yeah. the, the, the customers are not dumb. They see the discount. So, yeah. you know, I've seen this over and over again. And I hear it when I talk to other brand owners and store owners that if you have a watch that's $600 today, and then you do a Black Friday sale and it's $500, no one will ever spend $600 on that watch again. Yeah. They'll no, they're next expecting sales and wasting for them. Yeah. You just set the price $100 lower. So, yeah. We don't do that anymore. I stopped doing it like two years ago. And I had, I had to go through a period of time where it was a learning experience where I was making too many watches too quickly. I ramped up production. We had like five models we produced in the first two years, which was way too many. We were producing 500 at, you know, at a clip, 500 pieces per model. I didn't have enough variety in there. I was doing two colors or three colors when it should have been fives or six colors. Right date, no date options. I, I should have been giving people more choices. I should have been making things so quickly. And I didn't understand the importance of turnover to your cash flow. And then I ended up with these huge inventory numbers and I had a discount. So we were doing yeah. Black Friday, St. Patrick's Day, Canadian <laughs> Independence Day, you know, Br British Mother's Day, American Mother's Day. I mean, any, any excuse to have a, have a sale. Yeah. But Did then all of a sudden it was like, we never sold a watch at full price anymore. So we just stopped yeah. doing it. And I go, that's the price. We're not discounting it ever. Did you have much kickback from those sales then from people who did pay full price? Every so often I would yeah. get somebody that goes, this is crazy. Like I just bought this watch from you a week ago or a month yeah. ago and now you're having a sale. I want, I want a rebate. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry. I'm not doing it. And I, you know, sometimes, sometimes guys would get angry, but I'm not Amazon. You know, there's no, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have a best price guarantee. I mean, yeah, that doesn't yeah. exist. Price match so, or anything like that. Okay. But, uh, but we still do, um, so I have a loyalty rewards program on my website, but like 90% of my sales right now are through my retailers. So, okay. you know, I'm pushing more and more customers to the retailers. We're doing mm -hmm. fewer and fewer sales to my own, my own website. We do have a loyalty rewards program. It ends up being like about 5% back. Um, <laughs> and that's it. I mean, if you have a bigger yep. order, we'll do free shipping, but most of my retailers do free shipping and they yeah. throw in little extras. So <laughs> when somebody goes, well, I want to buy from you because I've got rewards points or I want to earn rewards points. And I go, all right, I'm going to charge you shipping. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to not put in the little extras. When you buy a watch from me, 
somebody in our, our warehouse puts the watch in a box and ships it to you. When you get a watch from one of my retailers, there's like a cookie, a chamois, you know, there's, there's some other little nice things in the box yeah. that I don't add. Cool. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Another can of worms you didn't feel like opening. <laughs> it was good. It's good to know the ins and outs of, uh, of guys behind the watch manufacturers. So you, you have, you're married, you got a little baby girl right now. Is that right? Yeah, well, I've, I am married. I used to have a baby girl who's now a baby, well, a toddler, who's four years old. Wow. And I have, uh, yeah, I've got a son now who's uh, nearly one. Oh, so, mazel yeah. tov. God bless. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and a dog. And a dog. And are you yeah. still doing website design? Yeah, so um, development. Uh, it's only in town, so it, it, I live on the outskirts of a town, and, and the office is in the town centre, so it's like two miles journey so i'm quite fortunate how close it is i work for my brother-in-law as well which is pretty handy um so uh, yeah i've been doing that for eight years now i think uh, before that I was electrician so let's go back to something you were saying earlier about you only yeah. review watches that you're interested in so okay. you know one, one topic that i see coming up online a lot among watch enthusiasts is there's no such thing as a bad review you never see a bad review these guys are all inherently biased because they always say good things about the watch. Okay. And I've heard this from other bloggers, like, you know, again, the time bomb has told me that if he knows he's not going to like a watch, yeah. he doesn't want to pan it. What's the point? He doesn't review it. Or if yeah. somebody kind of twists his arm or, you know, just sends him a watch and says, you know, say whatever you want about it. Okay. Yeah. And, so you know, so how do you tell a brand owner that you don't want to review their watch? You just go, not interested or do you actually give them feedback and on why and, and what you think they need to improve? No, I don't, I personally don't tend to, I mean, reflecting on it, perhaps I should be more, more helpful, but I don't tend to give them too much feedback, more of a, a respectful decline. Just say, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm, I'm really, really busy and it's just not interesting to me enough for me to, to spend the time on it. Really, really sorry, but I'm going to have to decline. So basically, so, you lie. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I am always really busy, so that's true. <laughs> no, I believe that, but you're basically <laughs> saying that instead of telling them I don't like your watch. Yeah, I suppose I I, I tell them that it's not really interesting to me, rather than I look, man, look, man, I hate your watch. <laughs> <laughs> I want to vomit when I look at it. <laughs> right, which. Okay. Maybe I should be more harsh. Maybe I should take a leaf out of your book. <laughs> not, not in being harsh, but in being a, a lot more straight, straight up. So off the top of your head, you know, what percentage do you think are watches that people offer you to review that you like and you do review versus ones that you don't like and you don't want to review? Uh, it's a good question. Probably, probably one in four inquiries I get is actually a watch that I am reasonably interested in reviewing. There are so much rubbish that comes through the, the, the contact form. You see those like minimalist, those same style watches over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm sure I'm not the only uh, watch blogger who, uh, who has this issue, but it's just like, why do these brands think that they're offering something different? You know, and they, they write these amazing press releases, which make it sound like the most amazing watch in the world. And you click the link and you're like, ah, nah, I'm all right, thanks. <laughs> if, for those brands, I don't even bother getting back to them. I'll be brutally honest because they, it's just not worth it. Um, do, you think, do you think that they are sincere but just not that intelligent? Or do you think they're just very cynical and hoping that you'll, you'll bite on whatever they have? They, they yeah, I, I think most of the time, I don't know what they must be thinking because if they did any genuine research, they would see there's so many other watches in this style. They're obviously, they're probably all made in the same factory for all I, all, all I care with like a different logo. Do you get the um, sense that they're emailing you from a, an office in China or from someplace else in the third world? Or is it a lot nah, of people in Britain? I think they are, they are actual guys from like Australia, New Zealand, USA, Britain. Um, but they've just like, they they rustled up their own logo in their own website, put the logo on the on a pretty stock factory watch, and so it's kind of a slap together get rich quick scheme. Exactly, they're in it for like a quick quick buck, um, but it's not like a, an actually exciting watch. And I don't know how they manage to actually sell them, because maybe they don't. 
Yeah, maybe they don't. Yeah, so it's only really the uh, the watches that really interest me that I'm interested in. Um, I What's also interesting to you lately. Have you seen anything recently that kind of you know really blew your doors off? Um, so I've I've got at the moment the new Formex. That's pretty nice. So yeah, I'm, those are interesting. I really like Formex. Is that um, the essence? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's a nice looking watch. Yeah. Have you seen it in the? Did you see it at District Time or? Uh, oh. I don't, I think I saw it at District Time, but I first saw it at the, um, so you went to Watch Time London, they did an event in New yes. York, and I guess that was last, almost about a year ago, that's where I first saw it, and they were there, they were, they're good guys, oh, yeah, I, met, really um, I met both of them, and, uh, and John Keel from Watch Gauge carries them in his store, oh, so, okay. uh, it's a really interesting watch, a gorgeous yeah. watch, a little bit big for, for me, yeah, um, it, is, but, it is quite on the big side, but it's quite, yeah, I mean, what is it, 43, 45, something like that? Uh, I don't know the spec off the top of my head. Yeah, probably about 43. Older yeah. Still. I um, mean, gorgeous watches. They're just a little bit yeah. big for my taste. But I yeah. like the, um, I, you know, I, I think it's a gimmick. It's a cool gimmick, but that whole suspension case where it bounces yeah. up and down. Like, it, is, I mean, it is absolutely a gimmick because, yeah. like, the way do you need it? But it's, it's like a really cool thing still. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't it's, need this. It doesn't yeah. add anything for me, but it's a really cool thing. I kind of want it. It is impressive craftsmanship for the price to be. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, and I think um, that's another example of people that are kind of overly spec obsessed. They go, well, it's, you know, basic at a movement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why is it 800 or $900? And I go, did you not see the case? The entire central cylinder has like a suspension system where it can move up and down inside yeah. of the frame. That alone is something that you're not going to see on everybody else's wrist. Yeah. That's why they charge more. It's more expensive to produce. Now, you may not want it or value it, but that's why it costs more. Yeah. And to, with Formex watches, actually, the anti-reflective coating on their crystals is actually the best I've seen on an affordable watch. It is mind-blowing. Challenge accepted. Yeah, go on. Get on that. Because I, I always say this, like an effective anti-reflective crystal I don't know, it, it always somehow transforms a great watch into a flipping fantastic looking watch because when you get just an insanely crystal clear crystal, it can it can really make the difference to be honest. Tell me about the Formex crystal. Is it flat or, or domed? It's flat. And I think so it's um, just coated on the underside as well. All right, so that's part of it. So it's a little bit easier to get yeah, real rather good though, transparency yeah. with a flat crystal because when you get a dome on it, you get that light bending yeah, you, and it yeah, adds reflection. Yeah. Um, so other watches that I've liked uh, very recently, the um, the latest Christopher Trident is a great watch. For the what moment. do you make of Christopher? Well, you can't you can't criticize them, but you know a lot of guys online talk about the constant logo changes and font yeah. changes, and and you know they're another brand that has a sale. It seems like every other week. Mm, you know, do, do you get a sense for Christopher Ward as a brand in transition? Or are they are they come out the other side of a transition already? I think, they, I think they have come out the other side of the transition now. Um, speaking to them because I, I speak to them quite a lot, to be honest. Um, I've been going to like their they do they do their own sort of like little get-togethers uh, with watch fans in, in the UK, and I went to one just before World Time in August. Um, and this the branding that you see on Chris Ford at the moment, despite so many people hating on it, that is that's it now. Uh, but it's still, you know, it is an unusual thing, really, to go through a few. Like, this would be their third logo now. And that's not something... That I think it's at least their third logo. It might be yeah. their fourth. I lost maybe, track. Maybe their fourth, yeah. So that, yeah, that's been quite an unusual journey for them, I suppose. But I, as far as I'm aware, that's it now. Uh, and what you see now is going to be it for, for good. Um, so I, think, also, I mean, I wonder, too, like, the Trident is a model that's gone through several different looks over yeah. the, you know, the course of its evolution. And, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time that, you know, sort of spoon knife fork set, you know, handset was, you know, really, I think so characteristic of that design yeah. and they've kind of gotten Absolutely. away from that. Yeah. And, they, and they've kind of, I don't want to say generic is too pejorative, but the, the, the new Trident design is a little bit more traditional, I guess, conservative. And I think they've lost yeah. a little bit of that edginess. Do, mm -hmm. do, you, do you foresee them bringing some of that back? Or is it, no, this is, the new ver this is the new direction of the company? Yeah, I don't think we'll ever see the onion and sword hands um, again, which is a shame because 
like you say, it was very, very characteristic. Uh, and the, the Trident was like one of their very first watches. Um, and it was awesome <laughs> as well. Yeah, I mean, I loved I, it. I love the version with the orange bezel and the wave uh, texture dial. You know, yeah. that was like five years ago. Yeah. And, you know, they kind of, they started to gradually migrate away from, you know, that sort of very distinctive design to a more traditional, conservative, yeah. almost, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know. It, it's sort of, I guess, endemic of the times, you know, that sort of ubiquitous sans serif font. Yeah. You know, very crisp you know, non-numerical indices, non, you know, very indistinct handset. I kind of feel like, all right, you know, I guess like, it's kind of like the, the diver version of the Bauhaus look, where if you've seen it once, you've seen it over and over again. And I think you're Christopher Ward. You are the, you know, sort of benchmark for affordable British brands. You know, it's basically you and Bremont are kind of, you know, carrying the flag for all of the yeah. UK as far as like what the world understands, you know, then you get into like Hamptons and, you know, the, some of the yeah. other lesser known, yeah. you know, UK brands, but Christopher Ward and Bremont are like the two biggest, well, most well-known brands. Yeah. And they both are kind of going in that direction away from characteristic designs that are very identifiable as being a Bremont or a yeah. Ward, towards things that are more generic. I don't get it. I mean, it could be from, as you get bigger, you need to make business decisions that, uh, Mean no. you sell more, maybe. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I really, I really, really like the new Trident. It is like the only thing that is the same uh, as the the model before is the the Trident, the deep stamp Trident on the case back, and the Trident as the counterweight on the second hand. They're the only things that are, that are the same. However, I still really, really like it. I think the actual, actually, the hour hand being quite a, a big, sort of like chunky triangle, that is quite unusual. That I must admit i've not really seen a, a fat triangle like that too often so i do like that i really like the glossy dial as well and the um uh, the bezel insert um ceramic bezel insert is nice and glossy as well so it does look does yeah look I mean, they, they know how to do a dressy diver i i can't take that away. i mean it's a good looking watch it's a it's a good design it's a good looking watch i'm not saying it's ugly in fact i would say a lot of people that really hated the old handset that was much more distinctive will probably yeah. love it yeah, now, yeah but i think it's yeah, the, the old you know ones. <laughs> i feel like they've lost a bit of their swagger i don't know yeah. if that's you know yeah. i always kind of liked christopher ward had that sort of very distinctive style um well that, that c65 dartmouth series is really nice looking isn't it yeah they're they're new they've just released a bunch of sort of like military inspired divers which are pretty nice yeah so, I mean, and, and the quality is outstanding i can't fault them for that either yeah um so this is something that I've been wanting to ask you. Okay. Um, from your perspective as an enthusiast and as a blogger and as somebody that knows a lot of British brands and obviously being British yourself, yeah. what is it you think distinguishes the UK market from other parts of the world that you think brand owners would, would, need, would do well to understand? You know, if you're talking to a bunch of brand owners in Singapore or a bunch of brand owners in America, what is it we need to understand about the UK market that is a little bit different than other parts of the world? Ooh. Because <laughs> I feel like it's something, but I haven't been able to put my finger on it. There's something about the British market. And again, yeah. it's always been a good market for me, but, you know, there's a British thing that's like your tastes are slightly different. I yeah. think your, your expectations are a little bit different and the way you react to certain things is a little bit different. So what is it, what is it that makes the UK market different? In your I mean, I can't... <laughs> Not being, I don't, I don't know. Care for this question at all. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, we are a very conservative bunch um, for the for the most part. So I, uh, I, I literally cannot say. And well, I mean, is it that? Is it just your tastes are more conservative typically? Could be. Could be. Yeah. Um, we live, yeah, it, it could literally just be that. I mean, I I don't have much experience in sort of like marketing and uh, actually being the other side of the watch brand. So I don't know sort of like the sales. Like, it's, it's quite interesting that you say like you, you do sell well in Britain, but there's there's something there that's slightly different. And I didn't actually realize that. So maybe we, 
we are different without realizing it. And <laughs> we just need well, to realize it. <laughs> let me let me put that in perspective. So generally, depending on you know what year I'm looking at, seven somewhere between two thirds and eighty percent of my business has been in America. Yeah. So the majority of my business is domestic here in my own country. But yeah. once you get outside of my country, the UK has always been, if I look at it strictly country by country, the UK has always been our next strongest market. Um, right. And I could chalk that up to, we share a common language. Um, yeah. Maybe there's some cultural affinity there. Maybe I just, I'm, maybe mm -hmm. I'm doing something that the people in England like. Um, but if I look at the EU as a whole, yeah, excluding the UK, it's right there, you know, on par. Uh, and in yeah. fact, recently we've done probably as many sales, if not more sales in the EU as we have compared to um, the EU sales have been coming on strong recently. Um, but, okay. you know, I, I talk to my, I talk to people online all the time and a lot of them are usually my customers or people that might be customers. So I talk to a lot of guys in England and, you know, we have a lot of things in, I mean, what was it something it was that Winston Churchill said, England and America are two company or two countries divided by a common language or, or united by right. a different language. What, what I'm, not with, I'm not familiar with the saying. I don't know. I'm gonna, now I have to Google it. Yeah, Google it. America and England separate. American and England are separated by a common language. Okay. That's the that. So you know, yeah, we we have a lot of things in common, but I always kind of notice, like, all right, sometimes I don't know when. An, an English person is, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> taking a piss, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, well, subtlety is not, maybe not yeah. my strong suit. We're quite a sarcastic bunch, I suppose. In that you really of, are a bunch of sarcastic people. bastards, I gotta say that. Yeah, it can be quite difficult to understand from people who aren't English, I suppose. Well, there's the accent, and then sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the printed word. Um, so, tell, all right, so let's get back, let's get away from Christopher Ward and trashing oh. the, the, yeah. before I lose any business in the United Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> So other than the uh, the Formex and what Christopher Ward is doing, anything else you really like lately that you see brands doing that you think deserves more respect or more attention? Um, another watch that I really, really, uh, I was really, really impressed with at Will Time was the Boulder Expedition. Oh, yeah? Um, that really, really impressed me in the metal. And I've actually since arranged with Leon to get one for, for a review. So I'll be reviewing that, you know, in the near future. But... Handling that, that was a really nice sort of like field explorer kind of watch. Um, so that, yeah, that that was that was really nice to. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know how long they've been around. It hasn't been quite as long um, as I have, but they've kind of really exploded onto the scene. They're they're just they came out, and they hit it hard, and they're they're coming yeah. out with new models all the time. And I see yeah. them everywhere, so I, I they must be doing well. Yeah, there's been a couple of Dan Henrys that I've really liked as well. Got the 1964, I think, which is sort of like a. a uh, a tag Carrera, vintage Carrera kind of right. chronograph style. I see, that's I see, that's cheap and really nice for the price. I see you reviewed the uh, the A Big Holdra, my buddy Chip's new uh, diving watch. I love. Yes, it. yeah, I had that just uh, last uh, April, uh, August time, I think. Uh, yeah, but I gave it back to him at, at Will Time, so I had it just for a week before Will Time. I got a review. That's amazing, actually. I love. Uh, he's a he's a fantastic designer. Some of his little design features are great. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, 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 I've said this for a long time. I think Chip is the best designer in the business. I think he's got perfect instincts. Um, yeah. Every decision he makes, I just think is perfect. And he's got a great eye for detail. Yeah. Um, and he's yeah. one of those guys that a lot of guys, I think, will over-design. They'll try to jam too much in. And some guys will kind of stop too soon. He's yeah. a guy that knows exactly when to stop. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell yeah, me about this man. Is it millennial? Is that how you say it? Oh, millennial. Yeah, they're... Um uh from the far east so they uh they did the the quartz one that i reviewed there but they've just released an automatic version um it's a nice looking so, watch yeah it kind of has sort of that vap house feel to it yeah um yeah, but i saw them on the forum i saw them on the forum asking for feedback and I, I think they get a lot of static about you know a lot i think a lot of people criticize their choice and brand name yeah because um when i first saw it i was like oh, is this mile meal i didn't realize that it was pronounced millennial and then millennial I didn't realize me not say was me not say I thought it was my knees yeah I, well I mean yeah I mean like we read them as we as we as we read them most of the time don't we um and then millennial you know the the person a person who is a millennial maybe that's got like an unusual connotation as well so maybe people are like look dude that's a bit of a 
lame name, really. I see what they where they try to what they try to do with it. Like it's millennial, but spelt different with nice accents and stuff. But right, and <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the cultural term millennial yeah. and all the yeah. negative connotations that sometimes brings with it. It's actually, you know, kind of a forward thinking name, you know, it's millennial, but yeah, true. I think too many people, especially online, they kind of view it as a, I don't want to be associated with that generation. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. There are a lot of reviews from brands on your website that I don't know the brands are, are like, yeah. is it no, Nove, Nove, N-O-V-E? Yeah, Nove or Nove. Um, are they based yeah. in the UK or Europe? No, they're Swiss. Um, they're Swiss? Well, that's quite an unusual, very, very thin diver. Um, I can't remember how thin it was, like 6.8 mil or something like that. Oh, I did see these guys. It's a quartz movement, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very um, thin. So a, a distinctive looking watch. It's not for everyone, that's for sure. Right. However, uh, I love the ratcheting system. They've got like the exposed ratcheting system on the bezel. That's pretty cool. However, it's most likely going to get a lot of grubbiness in there. It's um, very cool, but you probably will be completely disgusting after a yeah. year of wearing it yeah i'll get loads of skin cheese in there probably um yeah. <laughs> i could have done without hearing that term Thank sorry you for that that's um, right. <laughs> yeah no that's great thank you yeah that I, that'll I come like... to me very, i'm sure that i'll be i'll be thinking skin cheese a lot today <laughs> yeah i do like um reviewing brands that i've not heard of but they're doing something different like nove are quite a good example of that um you know, and it's rel relatively cheap as well. I think it's like under three hundred and fifty dollars. So it's quite imp like quite impressive watch for that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting piece. I mean, especially, yeah. I mean, I I think um, if you look at like a uh, Zarek and watches like that that are on the lower end of the price scale, yeah. and all right, if you're a real true watch geek, that's probably not your style. But if you can appreciate something that's kind of like weird for its own sake, yeah. There are a lot of interesting, you know, watches yeah. like that, that they're not that much money. If you just want something kind of like as a weird sort of conversation piece to wear yeah. once in a while and not yeah. spend a lot of money on it, that's not a bad choice. Yeah. What about um, Aries Gold Jolter? Jolter? Yeah, that was, a, that was a really interesting watch. I think. Very similar to uh, another sort of aviate kind of exposed skeletonized uh, chronograph. That's I've never heard of these guys. Are they based in Europe? UK? Uh, no, they're Far East, I think. Um, okay. I forget exactly which country, so I'd, I'd better, it's better to not mention which country just in case I get it wrong. Was it decent um, quality for the money? Yeah, really nice. And again, they had the, looking at it up close, you know, it was, it was deceptively well manufactured, like all those intricacies on the dial. Pretty good for the, for the price. So that's um, a great example of, you know, that's a watch that, I know there are lots of guys on the forums and Facebook that they, they might see a watch like this on like AliExpress or, you know, on mm -hmm. eBay and turn their nose up because they think, well, it's too cheap. How good could it be? Yeah. And, you know, I like the looks, but I'll, I'll you know, I'll save up for a, I don't know, a Zenith to five. Maybe that's a little bit unrealistic, but, <laughs> you know, if it's a good watch, even if, I mean, like, who cares if it's made in China and comes from China? Yeah. If the price okay. is right and the quality is decent, it lasts long enough to feel like you got yeah. your money's worth. Yeah. Where's the harm? Yeah, yeah. Another watch which is really good is a, a Perpetual Watch from Hong Kong. Oh, yeah. I know those guys. They He's actually like a real serious watchmaker. When he yeah. does like the chronographs, he'll take the whole pe the whole yeah. movement apart. I mean, because they're seagull movements. They, you know they have, you know, a higher defect rate. He won't sell one if he hasn't taken it apart and rebuilt it. Yeah. He makes beautiful so, regulators. Yeah, those are yeah, nice yeah. watches. And so he has like a waiting list. Is he even making them anymore? Oh man, um, for the popular watches, uh, like he does them in like batches of thirty or fifty because they make them all in their Hong Kong workshop, and right. um, yeah, they sell out straight away. Um, thankfully, yeah, I have virtual. You have one, the SC03. Yes, the watch. I mean, again, really? not my style, but no. it, you know, and to be honest. Piece. Yeah, to be honest, it's not necessarily my style either. However, for the price, I think it's $180, enamel dial, heat-treated blued hands, obviously a very well-regulated movement in, as well, and just the general build qualities. And think about how many people on the forums and on Facebook are too snobby to mm -hmm. buy it because it's you know, made by a guy in China, and they don't know. That, that watch, for the money, if it came, or for the quality, if it came from Switzerland, uh, that's... Yeah. $2,000 watch. Yeah, Easy. absolutely. 
Yeah. This is, and he's, he charges what, less than $200? Yeah, it's crazy. So more often than not, it is, a, it is a label. That is like an interesting change that I've noticed in recent years, actually, that um, the quality coming out of, uh, is probably mainly thanks to sort of like micro brands like yourself and, and other, other brands that you, you don't, the, the Swiss made label is sort of like losing its weight almost because you can get such epic quality watches made in China, but to the same, if not a better standard than the, many of the more affordable Swiss made watches. So, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting a, a better watch if it has a Swiss made label on. No, I, I, again, I could write, I could write you a book here, but I, I try to get people to understand, look, when you make a product, forget about where it's made. You have to define the quality standard up front and then figure out what is it going to cost you to get there. So apples to apples, I can get a watch every bit as nice as what you can get made in Switzerland or made in Germany. I can get that watch made in China, but the yeah. cost is going to be so much lower because not just because they have lower labor rates, but they don't have the same government regulation, you know, in terms of like workplace safety, environmental mm -hmm. concerns. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not taking a position on whether or not that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, you know, a lot of it is the labor cost, but it's also just, you know, layers of bureaucracy upon bureaucracy. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can get that quality no matter where you want it to be. It's just a matter of what are you willing to pay for it? And at, yeah. a, at a certain dollar point, you're actually going to get more for your money buying something that, you know, most of the parts are made in Asia. Who cares where it was assembled? And Again, I mean, people think it's all sweatshop labor, but I've been there. I mean, our assembly room is a clean room. It's yeah. spotless and, yeah. and they're skilled labor. I mean, there's actually a shortage of these guys because they just can't keep them. There's just so much work available for them right. that they're, con and they're, they're constantly sort of scalping each other's employees over there. Right. You know, we, we had a delay recently because we lost somebody on our assembly team. It's only six people. You lose one person, yeah. you know, you're at, something like 80% capacity all of a sudden. Yeah. And, and, and it causes a big problem. Yeah. Um, huh. Interesting. Yeah. So, so yeah. Really cool things on your website that I wouldn't ordinarily see or take a look at. Um, cool. Anyway, what's, so what's coming down the pike? Anything cool that we should know about that you've got in for review? Um, oh, shall I have a quick look at what my list is looking like at the moment? So obviously this Form X is coming up. Um, I'm actually just about to review the Seiko cocktail time because of the thought, one? sorry, the, the Presage. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, not the brand, brand new one, but just the regular like Presage cocktail time, just because I've been a long time fan of it for a while. And I'm like, right, finally, I, you know, I'm going to get one of these. I'm going to buy one of these and see what it's like. Beautiful dial, crap, scrap. So replace the straps right away. Do you but, want to uh, take, yeah, that's, you know, do you have an opinion on like where Seiko seems to be right now? Cause they're discontinuing the SKX, which has been iconic. They're bringing out yeah. an upgraded Seiko 5. Their prices on their like sort of mid-range models mm -hmm. are going up. I mean, a lot of people are just going like, that's it, I'm done with Seiko. Do, do you have an opinion on, on what they're doing? It is a shame that the SKX line is going. Uh, I mean, the replacement uh, that, that has come through, the new Seiko 5, looks nice. There's some down, there's, well, there's some pros and cons to it, to be honest. Um, in the UK, I think there are up in at about 250 quid, which is pretty steep. Um, so I don't, I'm not surprised that they're, they're sort of like going this direction because it's been a while. I mean, you know, those, those are sort of SKX models have been out for flipping years and years and years. So maybe it was just time that they moved on. Uh, so I'm not surprised that eventually we've seen the end of them. And it's a good thing that they've, replace them rather than just canning them full stop so that's the right. good thing um but what so, do you think you know you'd be still to get a starve i mean starves were like 600 then they were 400 now you can't get one anywhere because they're replacing yeah. it with new, whatever i guess the presage line and they're more money and it doesn't seem like there's more watch there it's the same basic movement specs component yeah. they just renamed the model range and charge more well that's it i think it's Another thing as well is that the, say for instance, the Seiko, uh, the cocktail time and also the Sumo, they were primarily for Japanese only markets, weren't they? And the Presage line is sort of re-releasing it in the global market. So I guess they're thinking, right, now that, the, now that this is available to like, the US market, the European market, let's just look at the price. 
So I was a bit off track of the story, but um, I also lost track of how much time has gone by. It seems like six months, maybe a year ago, there was a news story I caught about Seiko hired, I think he was a guy from Omega to basically run the American market for Seiko. And they were going to start, start making a big push into more retailers, like more of an AD model, not, you know, not like TJ Maxx or Kohl's, but more, you know, sort of Main Street, watch AD, jewelers, get the brand out there more. Um, maybe, I, I don't think it was all about Grand Seiko, but I wonder where that strategy is. If this is what we're seeing now as part of that global yeah. strategy to yeah. make Seiko <laughs> more of a mainstream brand and, and a good realistic alternative to an entry level like Swiss watch. Yeah, yeah it could be then. Yeah, won't be surprised. All right, so... This has been great. I appreciate you taking the time. Hopefully, uh, people enjoy hearing from a blogger. Um, cool. Hopefully, guys in the UK will show up at your event this cool. coming yeah, Saturday hopefully. at 1 o'clock. One more yeah. time. So it's the Holiday Inn in Warwickshire? Inn. Yeah, rugby in Warwickshire. So um, just on the M1, M6 as well. So uh, right slap bang in the middle of Britain, man. Like right in the middle. Get, it from a, get to it from everywhere. Fantastic. Um, my absolute pleasure. It's been good to actually finally speak to you face to face as well, because we've been messaging so much over the past years. Also, you've been watch reviews as well, so we dealt with each other a good few years ago with that. So it's nice to actually see your face and and chat to you face to face. So cool. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Cheers.